Welcome to the IEJ Roundtable. My name is Yukari Yamashita, and I am from Institute of Energy Economics Japan, IEEJ. This is the eighth time IEEJ participates in the SU Think Tank Roundtable. This year, we chose circular economy as our topic. My keynote presentation today will discuss more specifically circular carbon economy with our outlook towards 2050. I hope today's discussion will assist you in your business policy making, business or policy making, and carbon neutral lifestyles. Next slide, please. We have two basic scenarios, reference and advanced technologies. I will also talk about post-corona transformation scenario and then circular carbon economy assessment. Next. Reference scenario reflects past trends with technology progress and current energy policies, while advanced technology scenario assumes introduction of powerful policies to address energy security and climate change issues. Next. Let me first talk about reference scenario. If you look at the left hand side, demand in emerging and developing countries increases by more than 50%. Demand in advanced economies decreases by about 10% for an overall growth of 30%. And on the right, major player of the growth changes from China to India. More than one third of the global demand growth comes from India while China's demand peaks in the late 2030s. Next. By energy, as of 2050, the world remained dependent on fossil fuels for 79% of total demand. Natural gas increases the most and becomes the second largest energy source after oil. The growth in oil consumption in developing countries by far counterbalances the decrease in advanced economies. Coal demand peaks in the mid 2030s due to a decline in advanced economies and China. Next. Now, the advanced technology scenario. Energy demand in advanced technology scenario is 15% lower largely because of the emerging countries, as of 2050, the world will remain still dependent on fossil fuels for 67% of the total demand. That is why we are talking about circular carbon economy today. Next. The world CO2 emissions peak around 2025 and will be lower than the reference scenario by 37% as of 2050. If you look at the right, decarbonization of the energy mix is a primary reason for the emissions reduction as well as energy efficiency gain. Next. This year, we assessed a post-corona world transformation scenario using scenario planning approach. Experts identified two drivers which transforms the world if the COVID-19 were to induce structural changes and stays there. These two drivers are emphasis on security and progress of digitization. Stagnation in transport induces supply chain reconsideration and thus self-sufficiency became important. Increasing nationalism starts to strengthen a threaten free trade system. Therefore, global economy is slows down. We are forced to stay at home and continue to work, study, and keep our lives going. This accelerates the speed of digitization and reduces demand for transportation while increases demand for electricity. We are still fighting COVID-19 and how this turns out 
is still unknown. And yet, the following is our attempt to quantify the world which we imagined. Next, please. In the reference scenario, the world economy will contract by 5.1% in 2020 this year before restoring a positive economic growth rate of 5.2% in 2021. After that, it grows at an annual rate between 4% and 5% while recovering from the COVID-19 disaster. Then annual growth rate will decrease from a 25 to 3% range and to a 2 to 2.5% range from 2025. In the post-corona scenario, stagnation in free trade causes the world economy to shrink 10% by 2050, as shown in the left. Global energy demand to shrink by 4% and concentration of demand remains in Asia. So we, we are still facing the same similar picture, even if the structural change occurs. Due to the stagnation in the transportation sector, oil demand peaks around 2040, but the fossil fuel dependency declines only slightly to 77%. Next. Now, on the influence of digital, digital transformation. In the reference scenario, electricity demand in the industry and building sectors surged along with the economic growth of developing countries energy demand becomes more electrified. In the post-corona scenario, digital transformation supports remote economic activities and further promotes the electrification, electrification rate by 2%. Next. In the reference scenario, the energy self-sufficiency rate of ASEAN and India dropped significantly and CO2 emissions peak in the late 2040s. In the post-corona scenario, a shift to domestic energy such as nuclear power and renewable energy occurs. The self-sufficiency and diversity improve in importing countries. You can see that on the left-hand chart that the both diversity uh, index and self-sufficiency rate go up, uh, moving towards the right upper corner. The peak of CO2 emissions is accelerated by 10 years due to economic slowdown and decarbonization in this scenario. Next. Now, today's topic, the circular carbon economy CCE or a 4-hour scenario. Global interests on the concept of circular carbon economy, CCE, are growing. It is a major agenda item at the G20 summit 2020 hosted by Saudi Arabia. Next. Circular carbon economy, CCE, is a holistic approach to manage carbon emissions as a closed circular system. CCE aims to utilize all available emissions reduction technologies by the four hour steps, reduce, reuse, recycle, and remove. Our CCE scenario assumes the utmost adoptions of four hour technologies for carbon neutral use of fossil fuels with all other assumptions based on the advanced technology scenario. Next, CO2 emissions are reduced by five gigatons from advanced technology scenario and approach the two degrees optimized path. While the share of fossil fuels of CCE scenario is almost same as ATSs, the mix of fossil fuels shifts from coal and oil to natural gas as a primary feedstock of blue hydrogen. Blue hydrogen, if you recall, uh, we had this uh, uh, roundtable on the topic of hydrogen two years ago. 
and blue hydrogen is a hydrogen made from fossil fuels, uh, but with the CCS. Therefore, by the time the hydrogen reaches the consuming countries, importing countries, it will be carbon-free hydrogen. Net CO2 emissions are reduced due to CCS, while the consumption of fossil fuel remains almost unchanged, around 67% of total. So we will achieve decarbonization while still using the similar amount of fossil fuels. Next. As shown in the left figure, power and transportation sectors have high potential of emissions reduction in CCE scenario, carbon, uh, circular carbon economy scenario, because blue hydrogen plays a significant role in both sectors. Coal power will be partially replaced with hydrogen derived from additional natural gas production. Hydrogen demand will grow in Asia. Next. In conclusion, regardless of the scenario, the reliance on fossil fuels remain high in 2050, and we are still far from a zero carbon economy. In the advanced technology scenario, it is possible to achieve significant demand, uh, demand reductions, but possible changes in attitudes due to pandemic could significantly alter the future. High expectations that blue hydrogen could play a key role even to pave the way for green hydrogen, hydrogen uh, generated from the uh, renewables. Production cost reductions and infrastructure developments required. Definition of carbon circular economy, CCE, needs additional refinements before this concept of CCE could be further publicized and accepted. Carbon circular economy is not the only solution. We need a variety of technologies and carbon-free energy to tackle climate change challenge, taking into consideration national circumstances. Government support and international collaboration are always essential, especially at the early stage of R&D. How to supply cleaner energy solution for the additional energy requirements of future generation should be part of the global solution. Next. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I would like to welcome your questions. But as a moderator also, I have to look at the uh, uh, screen of the uh, iPhone to see if there's any question. Um, I don't see any question yet. I uh, hope it will be incoming. Okay, I don't get the uh, question from the audience. Uh, is, um, is there any question from the panelist? If not, I continue on and then the, maybe the audience can catch up with the live discussion or what, oh, sorry, I was looking at the live discussion question. Uh, question. So without waiting uh, too long, I would like to now move on to the panel discussion portion and let me introduce my very distinguished four speakers. May I ask the secretariat to uh, pull out the uh, names of the panelists? Thank you very much. Today we have four distinguished speakers. Uh, let me introduce uh, in alphabetical order. First speaker is Dr. Arifan Berkel, the research director of Lux Research. Next speaker is Mr. Yoshikazu Kobayashi, senior researcher of the Institute of Energy Economics, Japan. Third speaker, uh, we welcome Mr. James Leyburn, Regional Business Development Manager of uh, DNV Global Oil and Gas. And lastly, Mr. Vi uh, Vipul Tui, 
uh, excuse me if my pronunciation is no good, head of uh, India Business, Sam Kolb. I have asked each panelist to make a presenta brief presentation as their opening remarks. They each have slides, so the, I will uh, ask them to go one by one in alphabetical order to make their opening remarks. So first, I would like to welcome Dr. Berkel, uh, Dr. Fan Berkel, uh, for the screening. Dr. Berkel, floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction and thank you for your uh, presentation and for the invitation to be here. Good morning, everybody. Um, I would like to talk today about circular economy from the perspective of the chemical industry, because carbon is not only an energy carrier, it's also an important uh, raw material for, uh, for the industry. And so I thought it would be interesting to link uh, what's happening in the energy transition to um, the, um, uh, to, uh, to the chemical industry. So I'm just waiting for my slides to pull up here. Um, I may be a bit slow because I'm looking at the uh, live uh, feed as well at the live stream, but it's a bit behind. So let's see if my first slide will appear. Ari, your slide is up on the screen. Right. The problem is I don't see it yet. Right. So my slides are here now. So it's about transitioning in uh, carbon um, in the um, in the global economy. Um, and the chemical industry is experiencing a lot of pressures uh, and. You could say it's a perfect storm right now for plastics. So first of all, there is uh, the environmental pressure. There's a lot of crackdown, especially I might add in Southeast Asia right now on plastic waste. As you can see, there's a clear uh, change in the trend. Uh, and this is looking at government policies, at stated government policies, where people would like to end landfilling of plastic waste by 2040 and end... Um, uh, incineration uh, by 2050. The EU has actually stated uh, goals for uh, a completely circular economy by 2050. Even if you achieve that, there will be about slightly less than one, right? 1.7 1, gigaton uh, per year emission of CO2 from plastics because it's impossible to go full circle to completely recycle all of the plastic. If we go to the next slide, you can see that the perfect storm is even worse uh, because at the same time, the feedstock base, so the product is under pressure, but the feedstock base is also under pressure from a switch to electric vehicles. What is shown here uh, is Lux Research's projection of the uh, light duty vehicle market. We also have a similar one for the heavy duty, but I just wanted to show you this one. It shows that in 2035, uh, about half the global vehicle sales, new vehicles sold, will be incapable of, uh, will, will be either a battery or fuel cell electric, and 38% of the new vehicles sold will use no fossil fuel at all. Now that's new vehicles sold. If you look at the fleet, uh, by 2035, about 18%, so let's round it up, 20% of the fleet Will, not, will be incapable of using any fossil fuels. And that of course results in a decrease in oil demand 
It also results in a decrease in refinery capacity, which results in a decrease in feedstock for the chemical industry. The decline in fuel demand from this phenomenon, only from this phenomenon, so not from any other thing that might, might be happening in, in the shipping industry, for example, or in aviation, just from this, uh, there will be 14% less demand for uh, fossil fuel, uh, for, for uh, automotive fuels compared to 2019. Next slide, please. So if the feedstock base is going away, what, where does the industry need to go? Now, we compared here um, the carbon price of various uh, sources of carbon. So we just wanted to look at the source of carbon, not at uh, the, uh, the, the material as a fuel, for example. So what we did is we looked at the price, uh, for example, for carbon dioxide, the price is the price of carbon capture. And we took out the value of any energy that's in the material. So if you look at diesel, we looked at the price of diesel, we subtracted the value of the energy contained in it to obtain a, uh, a same, a level playing field for comparing the value of carbon within certain materials. What's interesting about an exercise like that is that you can see that crude oil and biomass are pretty equivalent. Um, so crude oil and biomass are similar sources of carbon in terms of the value or the price of the carbon contained in them. Yet it's very difficult to introduce biomass, uh, biomass as, a, as a feedstock for the chemical industry. That is, that is a very slow progress, even though people have been trying very diligently. And why is that? The reason is the way you, you process biomass is very different. Biomass doesn't fit into the current industry of the plastics infrastructure of the plastics industry where you have NAFTA crackers, where you make things like polyethylene uh, or polypropylene predominantly. Biomass is well suited to make esters, for example, uh, but it's not suited for uh, low oxygen containing molecules uh, that now dominate the plastics industry. And this poses a problem for, a, not a problem, but a dilemma for the chemical industry. Do you want to continue to use your existing assets, uh, which are immensely valuable? Um, but then if you want to switch to a new carbon source like carbon dioxide or biomass, uh, it is not optimized for that kind of uh, new feedstock. On the other hand, it is optimized for recycling plastic. It, it is actually not that difficult to recycle to put recycled plastics uh, into the current NAFTA crackers, for example? Or do you want to switch to a new infrastructure and do you want to build new assets? So next slide, please. So basically the dilemma facing that industry from the carbon circular economy is do you need to adapt or uh, do you risk losing business? Right. Adapting, um, plastic recycling can easily feed crackers. Uh, recycling will also boost the image of, of plastics. It will make it more acceptable to the general public. Um, and you don't need to redesign a lot of products that currently use those plastics. On the other hand, if uh, the world is switching to a circular carbon economy, then the source of carbon will be uh, either carbon dioxide or biomass. And there will be cheaper methods of processing those than using the incumbents, adapting the incumbent infrastructure. So you're vulnerable to disruption. And there will be biomass or carbon dioxide because you cannot sustain the industry just on recycling. You will lose about 40% of the carbon doing that. So you need a supplement. Um, and then, of course, the additional issue is that it's way easier to make biodegradable plastics out of CO2 or um, out of uh, biomass than it is uh, using the current infrastructure. And biodegradable biomass uh, has a, a big advantage currently in the public opinion 
because of all of the problems that microplastics, for example, are causing. So I'm not bringing you a solution today. I'm just showing you the dilemmas of what it means from the side of the chemical industry to adapt to a circular carbon economy. Uh, and I'm very happy to discuss because uh, we have a very eminent panel here. So I'm looking forward to the discussion there. Thank you for giving me the floor. Um, let's move on to the next uh, panelist, I think. Oh, thank you very much, Ari. Um, this is actually uh, very, very interesting uh, because the, uh, we have been hearing about this uh, uh, banning the uh, plastic uh, garbage around the world, uh, the, like uh, paper straws, et cetera, et cetera. But we forget uh, that the, that will actually put the chemical industry into the corner because of the decarbonization pressure also uh, is speeding up. So thank you very much uh, for your angle. Now I would like to welcome uh, Mr. Kobayashi to the floor. Uh, Mr. Kobayashi actually uh, has been working on the same outlook I have just shortly presented. So I hope that Kobayashi-san will uh, uh, make a supplementary or more detailed information on the, uh, our attempt on the carbon, uh, the circular carbon economy. So floor is yours, Kobayashi-san. Uh, thank you for the uh, introduction, Yamashita-san. Uh, could you hear me? Yeah, I think it should be okay. So uh, I'm Yoshi Kobayashi, a senior researcher at the IEJ. Um, this is my uh, greatest pleasure uh, to speak for a think tank round table at this uh, prestigious Singapore Energy International Energy Week. Um, as Yamashita-san has already explained the outline of the, uh, our circular carbon economy scenario, I will add some more background or details of the outcome and the implications of the scenario. Since some of the slides uh, overlap uh, the previous Yamashita-san remarks, I may skip some of them to avoid redundancy. Uh, could you go to the next? Um, before elaborating our circular carbon economy scenario or CCE scenario, I would like to highlight a couple of things in this uh, 4R technologies to manage carbon because I understand that this 4R categorization is the key element of the concept of circular carbon economy. The concept of circular carbon economy takes the neutrality to various emission reduction technologies, and thus it covers a comprehensive menu of those technologies in its 4R steps or 4R categorizations. Mainstream technologies such as renewable energy, nuclear, and energy conservation are certainly included in the reduced segment of this 4R table in the left side of the table. While relatively uh, new and maybe unknown technologies such as CCU or carbon recycling are included in the reuse and recycle segment. The CCS and the direct air capture are categorized as the removed segment. So CCE is a very comprehensive and holistic approach to manage carbon in a society. What should be also highlighted in the concept of CCE or 4R, in my opinion, is that it features that the segment of reuse or recycle, which regards carbon as a resource, as my previous speaker mentioned. Um, so uh, in this um, uh, CC concept, carbon is not enemy, carbon is resource. So um, uh, in this sense, um, the concept of circular carbon economy is a very, uh, uh, brings us a very important implications for our climate actions. I believe um, these technologies like reuse and recycle has been developed for many years. But in my opinion, the value of those technologies has not been properly appreciated until recently. Could you go to the next? Now I'd like to go on to the CC scenario. Um, this slide is the same as uh, Yamashita-san's slide. So I, I, I just uh, briefly mentioned that 
uh, our scenario, PCE scenario, is an extension of the uh, advanced technology scenario, which means that we assume all uh, best technologies at first in ATS, and then additionally, we assumed uh, new technologies to decarbonize fossil fuel use. Uh, could you go to the next? Uh, this is assumptions for uh, our CCE scenario. Sorry for the small letters. Uh, if you have an interest in the detail of this scenario, please visit our Institute website. There is an English report downloadable uh, for free. So uh, from the 4R technologies, 4R technology tables, which I uh, showed in the previous slide, we pick up uh, several representative technologies. In the reduced segment, for instance, we assume that substitution of fossil fuel reuse with blue hydrogen in the power sector, transportation, and steel making sector. In the reuse segment, we assume that the uh, expanded production of biofuels based on microalgae. And in the recycle segment, we assume that the um, uh, extensive adoption of a concrete curing technology to, cap to capture CO2. And also we assume that the synthetic methane uh, produced by uh, carbon and uh, hydrogen. And in the remove section segment, we assume that the CCS will be uh, utilized to pr produce the blue hydrogen. I'd like to uh, note that uh, this assumption is uh, uh, just for scenario. So there might be some arguments on the uh, 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 assumptions of, the, of this assumption in terms of technical difficulties on economic hurdles and so on. But I understand this is a sort of simulation to capture the quantitative magnitude by assuming these uh, assumptions. Could you go to the next? Okay, this slide shows the primary energy demand and CO2 emissions based on these assumptions. First, as for the carbon emissions, as Yamashita san mentioned, uh, in the CC scenario, we will see uh, reduced carbon emission by five gigatons compared to uh, advanced technology scenarios. And at the same time, in the total primary energy demand, uh, we see that um, the consumption of fossil fuel will slightly increase and the share of the uh, fossil fuel in the total energy demand will remain almost the same at 67%. But at the same time, again, uh, we could reduce um, carbon emissions significantly. So the key message uh, in this scenario is clear. That is, um, if advanced technologies for decarbonizing fossil fuels are effectively utilized, we can reduce carbon emissions while keeping utilizing the fossil fuel. So um, fossil fuel use and uh, um, carbon emission reduction is not really mutually exclusive. We can um, achieve both uh, if we assume, if we adopt the, um, the technologies uh, to decarbonize our fossil fuel use. Could you go to the next? Uh, maybe I'll skip this slide because it overlaps. Could you go to the next? Yes. Um, this slide shows the uh, um, power generation mix in different scenarios in the outlook. As you see in the left chart, um, we see um, the declined share of coal fired power generation and the increased share of the hydrogen. Uh, this is because uh, we assume that. Um, some of the coal-fired power generation without CCS is to be replaced with the hydrogen power generation in a CCE scenario. So that is the biggest difference between the uh, ATS and CCE scenarios. Could you go to the next? Okay, this slide shows the hydrogen demand estimated in this scenario. The demand of hydrogen as of 2050 uh, will be um, uh, more than 1,100 uh, 1, million tons oil equivalent 
as of 2050. Um, this is a very large amount. Um, but um, uh, in our scenario, uh, we assume that this, this amount of hydrogen will be needed to achieve our scenarios. And 90% um, of the total hydrogen demand in this scenario will be uh, blue hydrogen based on uh, uh, fossil fuel with CCS. So in some countries, they cannot produce uh, their hydrogen by themselves because of the uh, uh, field stack availability and uh, uh, geological location to store carbon for CCS. So uh, in our scenario, uh, we assume that uh, 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 there will be uh, international trade of hydrogen and countries or regions with uh, abundant fossil fuel resources with CCS capability will be a major exporter of hydrogen, while in many of the Asian countries will import hydrogen as uh, due to the, uh, the limitation of uh, field stock and CCS uh, capabilities. And uh, obviously um, hydrogen is a difficult um, substance to transport. So we may need some sort of uh, hydrogen carrier. There are several uh, options for such carrier to, uh, of hydrogen, like uh, ammonia or um, uh, torrents. And some companies are developing technologies to um, liquefy hydrogen to a very low temperature and transport as some like um, LNG. So we are not sure uh, which option will prevail in the future. Um, but the uh, important thing is um, we need to uh, uh, work um, hard to find how we can uh, uh, transport hydrogen at uh, an affordable cost. Could you go to the next? Um, Maybe I, I'm already spent more than 10 minutes. So I, I, could you go to the next? I will wrap up. Um, as a wrap up, I just like to highlight my key point that is um, by intensively adopting technologies to decarbonize fossil fuels, um, we can uh, uh, simultaneously achieve the um, carbon, significant reduction of carbon emissions and uh, using uh, fossil fuels. But in order to achieve such um, simultaneous uh, um, targets, uh, blue hydrogen will need to be produced at uh, uh, competitive cost. So uh, in this regard, we uh, should have work hard to achieve these um, uh, scenarios. And finally, um, in my opinion, the concept of circular carbon economy brings a very important implications for our climate actions. This is because the concept emphasizes the neutrality of technology. Um, by taking this uh, neutrality, various emission reduction technologies uh, will be an option for our carbon management. So uh, the concept of circular carbon economies uh, expands the available option for carbon management. So if in the future, we will not be able to reduce the carbon only with renewable. We will have a plan B. We will have another option to, to decarbonize uh, or reduce carbon emissions by having this um, uh, another option of decarbonization of fossil fuel. So uh, that's it for myself. So thank you for the attention. Thank you, Kobayashi-san. Uh, you didn't have to uh, uh, fast forward, but uh, appreciate uh, your effort to make it within 10 minutes. Um, so the Kobayashi-san's pre presentation were, uh, covers more about the uh, four hour uh, approach. And then the, he uh, highlighted the, well, we have been doing more the re reduce reduction efforts, but uh, we also have to uh, develop some technologies applicable for industries for reuse or uh, recycle. And then that is exactly uh, which touches upon the Dr. Berkel's, Van Berkel's uh, presentation about the chemical industry. And he also emphasized that the carbon management uh, will be required uh, if we cannot uh, solely depend upon renewables or nuclear into the future, where decarbonization is very strongly uh, required. Okay, so thank you Kobayashi-san. And now I would like to invite uh, Mr. Leyburn 
uh, to the screen. Uh, Mr. Labor, uh, floor is yours. Good morning, uh, Mr. Yamashita and ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for this opportunity to be here today. Uh, my name is James Laybourne. I'm, I'm the Regional Business Development Manager for DMVGL Oil and Gas based here in uh, Singapore. Um, and I'm also leading uh, a lot of our engagement with the oil and gas industry focused on decarbonisation efforts. So this morning, I, I'd like to very briefly touch upon the role of the circular economy in the future of the oil and gas industry. And in doing so, I think I'll touch upon a few of the, uh, the four R's that we're talking about. Next slide, please. So all the figures and forecasts that I, I'm presenting today are taken from uh, DMVGL's latest uh, energy transition outlook, which was published last month. Uh, I've been desperately checking my figures against the IEJ, so we're not hopefully uh, uh, giving you contrasting information. Um, but this, this is an independent forecast uh, for the world energy mix up to 2050, uh, developed by DMVGL, and we do this on an annual basis. There's a dedicated report focused on the oil and gas, the outlook for decarbonizing the oil and gas industry. And we also have related reports uh, for the uh, power, uh, power sectors and the maritime sectors. I should really emphasize that our, our approach is not based upon, a, uh, on, upon specific scenarios, but rather it's a forecast based upon our current view of the world today. And this view changes over as the years go by. Next slide, please. So as presented earlier uh, by Ms. Ms. Yamashita, uh, we are close to passing the peak in uh, emissions. Uh, whether or not we've passed it is still up for debate, but we are at least close to passing that peak. And, and this is due to the effects of uh, growing energy efficiency uh, and the transition from coal and oil to renewables. But despite the fact that we're passing the peak, what uh, we believe that emissions are set to remain stubbornly high until the mid 2030s onwards. Next slide, please. Based upon our forecast, we will not be able to deliver the COP21 Paris Agreement. We believe that the 1.5 degree carbon budget will be exhausted before 2030 and the two degree budget uh, by the early 2050s. And if we extrapolate these trends, our outlook points to the planet warming by around 2.3 degrees by the end of the century. This is not really enough. Next slide, please. So our, our, our forecast, uh, very similar to IEJ, is based upon the continued role of natural gas as the largest primary energy source from the mid-2020s. We believe that current policies to drive the transition to decarbonise gas will only begin to take effect around the mid-2030s. And this will mean that only 13% of natural gas will be decarbonized by the mid-century. To stand a chance of meeting Paris targets, much more needs to be done, uh, and this needs to happen much sooner. Next slide, please. So as a result of this, pressure is mounting on the oil and gas sector to address its role in climate change. The industry is now increasingly putting energy transition at the center of its agenda but climate change and ambitions to reduce it are outpacing action. Today, what we see is that the oil and gas industry is focused on reducing emissions from the production and distribution parts of the process. Activities such as electrification, reduced flaring, so really focused on production, uh, the production phase. But this only accounts for around 25% of emissions due to the sector. The rest of the industry's emissions, the other 75%, come from the combustion of the oil and gas. Next slide, please. So by 2050, uh, the industry will be measured uh, much more on the full oil and gas value chain, including the combustion. Total emissions are only expected at the moment to drop by around a third by 2050. At this rate, the oil and gas industry will account for uh, more than 80% of the world's energy-related carbon emissions at that point, which is more a uh, greater percentage share than, than that today. So the industry needs to do a lot more to decarbonize much more deeply to achieve the international emissions targets. Next slide, please. 
as has already been highlighted uh, by a number of speakers, uh, hydrogen and CCS um, are, are, are really important and can, uh, and can play a much greater role in this transition. Um, we believe that they, they are a, a really a fundamental catalyst to the deep decarbonisation after around mid-2035, based upon current trends and current policies. From almost nothing today, uh, demand for hydrogen as an energy carrier is growing steadily and will begin to seriously scale from the mid-2030s due to demand from transport, the transport sectors and, uh, and maritime sector. Based upon current projections, hydrogen will supply uh, around a quarter of global uh, gaseous fuels uh, by 2050. And this is particularly driven by the European and Chinese markets. But as I said earlier, the, these projections are, are based upon shifting market interest and, and they're based upon our view of the markets uh, and policies today. The good news is that uh, our forecasts for hydrogen demand have tripled since only a year ago, uh, our last ETO report. And this is mainly due to recent policies and initiatives introduced by governments in favour of increasing hydrogen usage. Next slide, please. But CCS, uh, as well as hydrogen, CCS is also essential to this. Um, whilst uh, green hydrogen is commonly regarded as the ultimate destination for hydrogen, um, we expect that blue hydrogen will still account for 85% of hydrogen as an energy carrier by the 2030s and half by 2050. So blue hydrogen will actually be the driver behind the scaling of the hydrogen economy and green hydrogen will be the eventual destination. Next slide, please. So we see that the, reg uh, we see that the regional scaling of CCS closely matches that of hydrogen. We expect that annual volumes of CO2 storage uh, will grow by more than 5,000% um, by 2050. And this scaling will not happen, but, but this scaling will not happen early enough to help countries meet uh, Paris targets. On the positive side, once again, this forecast has changed quite significantly uh, since last year with a threefold increase in, um, in the volumes of CO2 captured by 2050 um, based upon the latest policies being released. On the negative side, the timeline for this transition doesn't appear to be shifting very rapidly. We don't feel that uh, the urgency is coming into the industry to accelerate this. So to succeed, CCS will need um, a, a much greater push, similar to renewables, uh, from government and industry to support technology development and subsidize the costs. If CCS is to become commercially viable, um, such as due to carbon pricing um, or similar policies, the cost can then fall uh, as it scales. But someone will, will need to go first. And at the moment, it looks very much like Europe and China are really pu uh, pushing the markets on, uh, on the development of CCS. Next slide, please. Okay, my last slide. Um, so as discussed, CCS and hydrogen technologies can transform the sector uh, to become a key contributor to realizing climate ambitions rather than missing, missing these targets. But crucially, these uh, and, and crucially, these technologies are already available. Uh, we're not reaching for some far out technology developments that, that don't currently exist, but they do need to develop and they need to scale. Decarbonized and green gases appear to have a bright future uh, with hydrogen and CCS, complementing renewables, batteries, and low carbon fuels to provide secure and affordable energy supply up to the mid century and beyond. Good public policies um, appear to be key to this. The sooner governments incentivize the industry to adopt technology, the sooner that the industry takes up this technology and, and pushes it down the, the cost learning curve to become independently financially viable. We've already seen this with uh, offshore wind, uh, with latest projects now becoming independently financially viable, but it's taken many years of investment and government support to get there. So forming partnerships between governments and industry will be crucial. Uh, working together to make hydrogen and CCS safe, effective and commercially viable will give the oil and gas industry the certainty it needs to manage new risks and accelerate its transformation to the low carbon environment, uh, low carbon future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Leyburn. 
Um, I am also relieved to see that the, our outlooks are in agreement. Uh, I recall uh, last year at SU, uh, I actually moderated the session where the DNB, uh, the outlook was launched. And then you, uh, I remember it was rather radical. It looked radical uh, to decarbonize by 2050. But by now, look at the world. Uh, everybody is committing to the decarbonization or carbon neutrality by 2050. So we we better uh, catch up or hurry up. So uh, this session, I hope, uh, will help uh, industries also uh, to to catch up with the. Uh, the trend uh, which is going on in political and financial sectors. Um, so thank you very much. Um, you emphasized uh, for the oil and gas industry, uh, the hydrogen and CCS are expected to play a more role, a more he the, uh, heavier role. Uh, and then at the moment, as far as CCS is concerned, the uh, capaci capacity development is uh, actually uh, fast forwarded in Europe and China. Uh, and then they, I like the last remarks about the, uh, uh, we need to do this and that and that, including uh, safety issues, uh, risk control and cost cut down, et cetera, uh, in collaboration uh, uh, within the industries. Okay, thank you very much again, Mr. Labor. Um, now I would like to invite Mr. Tuli uh, to make his presentation. So the floor is yours, Mr. Tuli. Uh, thank you. Uh, very good morning to all of you, and uh, thank you for having me on this uh, very interesting and very learned panel. Uh, I would like to complement uh, the previous presentations uh, by sharing a practitioner's view from India. As Ms. Yamashita has pointed out, India actually is, is projected to be the largest uh, incremental uh, consumer of energy. And uh, so in that sense, I hope uh, the audience and our panelists will find a, a perspective from India helpful. Uh, I'd like to share three things. First, from the perspective of uh, this major economy, how sustainability is really becoming central to the energy transition. But also what other considerations are in play such as access and affordability to balance uh, national objectives. Second, how this relates to the four Rs that are being mentioned. And third, what opportunities does this uh, present for energy companies and how companies, and I'll use the example of Semcorp, uh, what companies are doing and also what's missing. Uh, we can go to the first slide, please. So just by way of background, before I get started, uh, a quick reminder that for us at SEMCORP, we are, our DNA is really about sustainability and the circular economy. Uh, if I go back uh, 25 or 30 years when SEMCORP's energy business actually started, it really started at Jurong Island. And if you think about the concept and the, the core of what has made Jurong Island one of the most successful petrochemical industrial clusters in the world. It's really about the concept of sharing utilities, sharing uh, common facilities, recycling, and an enormous amount of efficiency, both in terms of energy production and usage, but also in terms of feedstock conversion efficiency and, and how one molecule goes through plants that are shoulder to shoulder to create greater efficiencies than any one so in that sense, it, it reflects the, really the theme of, of this uh, session, but also it re reflects, um, uh, I think, James' last slide about partnerships and, and different organizations working together. So with that background, we'll move to the next slide and, and let me talk a little bit about what's going on in India. So not only is, is India the third largest consumer of energy today, but as, as you said, uh, ma'am, uh, projected to be the largest incremental user of energy. And so there's, uh, I can tell you sitting here in the country and I've, I've made my uh, career in the, in, in the energy sector before SEMCOP, I, was, I spent uh, more than 20 years at McKinsey. Uh, I, there's a clear sense of both consciousness about sustainability, but also a sense of responsibility towards, uh, towards its role. Uh, and I think it's uh, largely good news 
because if I look at the left side, uh, India had its INDC commitments around emission reductions, um, around moving its, its very significant fossil fuel based um, uh, uh, portfolio towards, towards uh, cleaner uh, sources of energy and so on. But what's interesting is, uh, is that those commitments, despite Corona and despite uh, the volatility in, in economics and, and macro, macroeconomics really, that those commitments are actually increasing. So if I just listen to what our prime minister announced uh, actually just earlier this week, uh, he talked about the seven pillars of in India's energy uh, going forward. And if you just quickly look through these seven pillars that are on the right-hand side, they really span uh, most facets of the energy sector, whether it's going down the gas routes, whether it's cleaner use of fossil fuels, whether it's security around biofuels, whether it's security and uh, reduction of carbon through uh, through this uh, renewable energy. And, and I'll spend a moment on this 450 gigawatt um, target. Uh, barely 10 years ago, uh, India had uh, probably around 15 gigawatts of, of renewable energy. In less than 10 years, we are well on our way to, to crossing 100 gigawatts and possibly achieving 150 to 175 gigawatts in the next couple of years. And just as that target is coming close, uh, he's put a, uh, a very audacious target in front of industry to say, okay, 450 is what we're next going for. And then, but but also if you look at hydrogen, decarbonizing mobility and, and digitization. So it's, I would say if anything, the um, commitments are increasing, they're spanning the energy sector. And not only are they focusing on sustainability, but they are also sec uh, focusing on um, on security or energy security, because as as most of you would be aware, India is one of the has one of the highest percentage of imports of fossil fuels among all the major in uh, major um, economies of the world, and these changes are also I would say supported by underlying legislation and and regulations that support them, whether it's around uh, support to renewable energy, whether it's restrictions on single use plastics or whether it's city by city and, and state by state policies on encouraging electric vehicles. And as I said, the results are really showing already with this massive growth uh, in, in renewables being, being one among side of it. If we look at the next slide, not all is straightforward because if you think about what the country is trying to balance, and this is a good example with that, that applies probably to most developing um, uh, economies. It's really a, a balance between sustainability, but also, as, as the PM said, uh, justice or energy access on one side, and also affordability and security on the other side. If you look at the left side, it's very clear that uh, primary energy demand continues to grow. But I think the right side is more interesting, which is that per capita energy consumption still remains well, well below world, world levels. And of course, on one hand, the positive view is that that gives an opportunity to leapfrog in terms of energy efficiency and all measures are being taken for that. But at the same time, it also means that we're really talking about um, uh, uh, almost one fifth of the world's population that doesn't really yet have the kind of access to energy that, that the world, even the world average, I'm not even comparing with OECD, I'm just comparing with global average. So we're really talking about a massive uh, sort of increase in energy justice and just, just to get access. Combined with this, uh, I think is, and also an outcome of this in some ways, is this uh, shift towards electrification of the economy, which actually is part really of this transition um, and, and especially significant for an economy that is, I think, almost certainly more than 60%, probably closer to 70% uh, reliant uh, for its energy on fossil fuels today. Uh, affordability and both uh, also becomes a clear at these levels of uh, at these levels of consumption affordability becomes a clear, clear concern especially with some of the technologies being fairly expensive and imports really not available for instance for gas at the kind of scale that india needs and so while there's a strong push towards gas as one of the pillars it also needs to be balanced with with other uh, other uh, aspects i think the other con consideration is that there isn't really any non-fossil fuel based support for reliable, uh, viable baseload uh, energy. 
and fossil remains the key, as many of you have said. But I would like to point out two other things. One is that in many senses, the transition has already happened. For instance, uh, if you look at energy policy making today, it's very clear that uh, clean energy and renewable energy is prioritized over all other sources. And all measures and policies and supporting services that support renewable energy get the requisite priority. The other thing is that uh, as we come out of Corona, I live in Delhi, and, and Delhi, unfortunately, has uh, not a very good reputation for, for emissions and pollution today. Uh, but there's massive changes in attitude, because as we've gone through one of the world's strictest lockdowns, the effects on, on what happens around the, uh, uh, around the city and around the region to air quality, et cetera, is very, very clear, and it's palpable to everyone on the street. And it's, it's very interesting. You may or may not have heard this, but just yesterday, uh, the government has announced the establishment of a permanent 18-member commission, fully empowered to coordinate with all the re response, uh, all the neighboring states for the national uh, capital region, and essentially once and for all solve the emissions and air quality issue. And that's literally just happened yesterday morning. So if you think about access, you think about security, you think about affordability and sustainability, these are really the four uh, I would say, uh, key pillars being balanced by this major economy. So how does this link to the circular economy and how can companies sort of be part of the journey and the opportunities and what's what's missing? We can go to the next slide. Uh, I'll, I'll use the four Rs. Um, so at SEMCOP, as it is for the Indian economy, this transition towards these four Rs is really at the center of our strategy. It's in our DNA, but it's also the center of our, our, our strategy. And there's opportunities in each of the four. Uh, I may have misclassified some of these as I look at um, Kobayashi-san's uh, presentation, which was very insightful. But I would say out of the four R's for, for something the size of India, which is really the size of a continent, uh, all four are important. But perhaps this reduce is would be maybe the center or the maybe the most important, given the amount of growth and the opportunity to um, to leapfrog and to, to substitute uh, and go to cleaner, lower carbon forms to supply that growth. So, of course, renewables I've spoken uh, quite a bit about. Uh, certainly, there, is, there are already policies where only the most efficient fuel, uh, fossil fuel assets will get installed, and that too, uh, essentially to support baseload energy or to do replacement of retiring plants, which are, which are quite substantial retirements in themselves. But also uh, electric mobility. Today we have uh, uh, over 20 cities in India that are rapidly uh, uh, encouraging uh, electric mobility. The first hydrogen pilots actually started not so long ago, hard, barely, barely, uh, I think a month or two ago. Uh, and of course, the, the big question remains the affordability of storage is also its, its viability. Uh, SEMCOP has, uh, as one of the large players in storage, especially in the UK, uh, we we are at the forefront of that, and you know it certainly has a lot of promise, but there are also uh, concerns about uh, long term viability and and long term um, uh, reliability. CCS, I won't belabor the point, but I would totally agree with what the other panelists have said. CCS uh, uh, remains promising, but affordability remains a major concern uh, about um, uh, you know what will be the commercial models. But also, as you look at the other R's around, around uh, reusing and around recycling, uh, we look beyond the energy cycle. And, and certainly at SEMCOP, we, we uh, think a lot about it. We are one of the major players in Asia in wastewater recycling, including in Jurong Island, but on, in, in many other complexes as well. And whether it's uh, reusing um, municipal wastewater for industrial uses, or it's indeed uh, reusing industrial water in, in water scarce regions, uh, we have barely as Asia started to tap the extent of the opportunity and the depths of what can be, what can be used. Um, today, uh, India has policies on, on a minimum of 100% fly ash utilization for all thermal plants. And, and uh, as you look at uh, cement, uh, we, we are facing, uh, uh, SEMCOP is very much uh, at the forefront of that. We have more than 100% fly ash utilization as we speak. And uh, I can tell you, we've got customers lining up 
to uh, to take this not only from from our neighboring regions but also um, uh, from neighboring countries. Recycling, I think, is another area. Um, uh, Dr. Van Berkel uh, touched upon it, uh, especially on the waste to resource. Again, this is one area where technology development, I think, is just about at a very early stage, and there is enormous opportunity to create not just market capitalization value, but also real uh, PNL and balance sheet uh, profitability through uh, whether whether we are talking about you know oil recycling, whether we are talking about uh, uh, biomass recycling and biomass uh, conversions, flash distillations, and so on. We're just about getting started. But if I look at you know we we look at all of this and say what's missing and what's really needed. Uh, from a national policy level or from an industrial uh, partnership level, I would say it's really around the commercial solutions and the ability uh, for uh, for the right asset configurations and commercial market uh, solutions to come together. And I've just taken three examples here as uh, just as illustrations. I think one is is to ensure that future industrial and commercial developments really happen in clusters, which can maximize use and recycling of, of uh, both energy and materials. I think I've pointed out municipal commercial solutions. And what I really mean by that is uh, the viability of municipal local bodies and the capability and capacity building in the local commercial body, uh, municipal bodies to be able to ask for these solutions to pay for these solutions. So if you take something like simply waste recycling and move from, I, I found that chart very interesting to look at, you know, as you go from uh, landfills to incineration to, to sort of full, full recycling, the commercial solutions that underlie that are not necessarily available beyond maybe one or two cities. And so to take those solutions and roll them out across is a very, uh, is the, really the need of the hour. And then finally, I think um, uh, Kobayashi-san also mentioned this, uh, the cross-border carbon markets. Today, we've, we have uh, uh, some of the voluntary uh, carbon attribute or environmental attribute um, uh, products are traded, tradable cross-border, but those markets are still very intransparent. Uh, as Sencorp, we've re recent, recently gone into a partnership uh, to, to take forward you know, more transparency and, and market making in these attributes. But I think the big next step will have to be to allow cross-border carbon, especially in RECs and, and, and all uh, attributes to really make the commercial, uh, the, the, the flow of funds and the flow of viability gap uh, across um, all the, um, uh, across uh, all countries, including the, the ones who are cleaning up fossil fuels, as well as the ones who are very hungry for uh, for commitments to 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 do these and and, and matching the two, so uh, there's uh, I think uh, overall I'd like to end by saying we are quite optimistic. Uh, this is quite a uh, crucial and well underway energy transition. Lots of opportunities, lots of challenges as well, but it should be an exciting next ten years. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very very much, Mr. Tuli. Uh, it was very insightful, uh, especially coming from India. Um, we do hope that the, uh, all the industries uh, and then also municipal governments to jump in uh, to make this concept workable. And then the, I am also um, how does it, impressed by your opening, uh, talking about the air pollution, and you, how your government is serious about uh, uh, maintaining the cleaner air uh, for coming years, taking this opportunity. Uh, I see many photos from everywhere around the world, like a monkey has actually uh, uh, running, or running through the European countries, a big city, or a swan is back in Venezia, and that kind of uh, news. Uh, where they are actually, um, uh, how to say, giving up the idea that the water quality or air quality uh, won't come back in any time near future, but they saw it. The seeing is believing. So uh, I hope, I wish you the best for the air quality improvement in India to begin with. But you pointed out many uh, important uh, uh, the points. Uh, actually, you have um, um, echoing uh, what doctor, uh, what other speakers have already said, and then the, uh, you also uh, mentioned 
that you are trying to balance between the sustainability and the energy access or affordability. And then that will uh, be very important point if we are to, to combat this uh, challenge of uh, climate change globally, because we do have this sustainability target goals, and then we have to uh, make it happen also in parallel uh, meeting this uh, climate change challenge. Uh, when you mentioned the municipal uh, commercial uh, municipal commercial solution, it occurs to me that in Japan lately we are suffering from many severe weather incidents, and then the resilience is uh, being actually emphasized in our uh, government's policy making. And for that to make the resilience uh, strength uh, stronger, uh, we also need the municipal government's involvement. And then the, that will also make the locally uh, independent or locally uh, self-sufficient energy system. And that gives renewables a very good opportunity. And maybe the, even the recycling system uh, is part of the municipal government's responsibility. That, that is a very important uh, uh, viewpoint, I suppose. So thank you very much again, Dr. Tui, um, uh, Mr. Tui. And then the, uh, now we have can move on to the question, uh, I'm not sorry, the panel discussion uh, portion. I have prepared um, a few questions for the panelists and I have um, actually shared all these questions with the panelists beforehand. Uh, I am very happy to see the uh, few questions uh, upcoming uh, from the floor as well. Uh, but first I would like to uh, go through these questions before getting into that, I have one clarifying question to uh, Dr. Van Berkel. Um, about your presentation, you really quickly, Dr. Berkel, if you are there, uh, quickly mentioned that the um, um, because of the uh, um, shift towards the uh, cleaner uh, cars, uh, the ice will be uh, the number of the new sales of uh, ice-based uh, uh, cars will uh, reduce. Therefore, the uh, fuels for the uh, transport uh, will really decrease. And then that actually means the uh, implicates the feedstock for available feedstock for chemical industry. Is that what you said? Uh, I just would like the clarification. Is it because of this uh, value chain thing in the refineries that uh, you expect the uh, uh, chemical feeders feedstock will be less available because implicated by the uh, less demand for transport uh, field? Indeed, that, that, that's what I meant. And you can already see that some uh, oil companies are already announcing that they will be reducing their refining capacity. Actually, um, if you look at how oil companies have been writing off assets, a lot of oil companies have, have uh, taken, um, let's say, the opportunity presented by, by COVID-19, which of course has been disastrous for oil companies to also write off some of their assets uh, and a lot of that is refinery assets actually a lot of it is also upstream production but it's also refinery we looked at uh, and, and you can do that for yourself if you look at the uh, exports of um, plastics materials to china and you correlate it to the um, number of cars on the road in china there's there's a strong correlation between the two so as the number of cars in, in China on the road historically is growing, you will see that the export of plastics to China is decreasing. Why is that happening? Because as there are more cars on the road in China, the number of refineries is growing in China, which means that uh, the industry in China has more feedstock for producing plastics themselves. And therefore the need to import plastics is reducing. So, um, our basic thinking here is that mechanism can also uh, be run in reverse. If, if there's less cars using fuel uh, on the road, uh, refinery capacity is actually under pressure and therefore the chemical industry uh, is under pressure and they're already anticipating. And every major chemical company has a program uh, to find alternatives to their current feedstock situation. 
Well, thank you very much. Um, this is a, actually, I think that it's a very good example of what we have to think about in circular economy style. You know, one thing happens in, in Japan, we have a very famous saying that the, if the bucket the manufacturer uh, the, makes a business and then the, uh, then uh, no, if the wind blows and the bucket uh, uh, manufacturer will make business, but it's a very long story. I cannot, I have to cut it short, but uh, there is this kind of uh, economy in circular uh, relationship that we have to actually think about the uh, implication to very different industries, uh, the activities. And then that is, I think, I thought that it is very uh, important point. Uh, it's not only about the industry to industry, but from country to country. Um, and then the, each country has different ways of doing things. So I gathered uh, from all speakers a presentation also that even the four hours are different. Uh, definition is not yet uh, really uh, clearly uh, made, um, but uh, even which one of the four hours is important is different. Uh, already uh, Mr. Truly has pointed out that reduce for India, it will be uh, will carry more weight uh, for the coming few years or decade. Uh, whereas in Japan, we more or less uh, exhausted the energy efficiency, and then we have a limit in introducing renewables. Therefore, uh, we have to look into reuse or recycle. That was a Kobayashi-san's presentation. So now I go into the first question. Uh, I asked uh, uh, this question. The, which of the four hours uh, reduce, reuse, recycle, and remove is more applicable in your country and why? So, Mr. Truly, you volunteer to answer this one. So, uh, the floor is yours for you to answer. Yeah. Well, I, 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 uh, I won't repeat what I said earlier because as you, as you mentioned, I, I, did, I do think for uh, something for a, for a nation the size of India with uh, you know, 1.1, 1.2 billion people, all are going to be important. Uh, perhaps if I had to choose, I would say, given the amount of growth that is going to happen and therefore new capacity that's gonna happen, the opportunity mm -hmm. for deploying entirely newer technologies uh, and therefore reduce probably would be more important. But mm -hmm. I think um, I'd like to maybe use my time to underline the point that Dr. Van Berkel made and, and, and sort of illustrate the scale and extent to which that shift is um, playing out in this part of the world. So, you know, if you look at, um, uh, and, and the challenge that it, that it poses. So if you look at uh, the average refinery slate uh, in India, it's certainly about, I would say, around 50% is diesel. And uh, which if, you, if my numbers are correct, that means somewhere between, probably somewhere between 80 to 90, 95 million tons a year of just diesel uh, getting used in a year. Now, if you look at the top five uses of diesel, trucks, smaller vehicles, and then some unusual uses in India. Pump sets, it's agricultural pump sets mm -hmm. to pump water up. Power backup sets, because in case for areas where there isn't, uh, where there's unreliable grids, power backup gets done by diesel. And fifth is, uh, the, the railways as a major consumer. Now, if you look at these five and see what policies are already in place, the railways have already assumed, have already announced that they're moving to 100% electrification. Mm. Power is largely surplus. And while there are still some blackouts, those are very few and far between. So genset usage of diesel has declined sharply. Mm. Agricultural pump sets are still used quite widely, but there's a massive nationwide program, province by province, that is shifting them to decentralized solar agricultural pump sets. Cars, we, we know are uh, moving to, uh, to electrification, maybe not as fast as some of these other uses, but certainly faster than I, I expected 10 years ago, certainly faster than that and trucks is left. Now, if you look at that 50% or 80 to 90 uh, million tons of, uh, of diesel, uh, we've really got a situation where if this diesel demand was flat or if pet overall petroleum uh, product demand was declining, that wouldn't be so much of a problem. It would be a problem for the refiners, but it wouldn't be so much of a technical or other challenge. But with 
overall petroleum demand still growing? How does a refinery and a set of refinery or portfolio really completely almost turn on a dime to become more either petrochemical focused or become more, um, uh, how do they make both work where some products are growing, LPG demand is still growing very rapidly. NAFTA demand, fortunately, with petrochemicals is still growing. And how do they make this whole transition work? It's really quite, uh, uh, I would say, uh, both a technical and a commercial uh, a challenge. So uh, I just wanted to use that as an illustration of when we say, uh, you know, on a panel like this, one little R could mean so many things for the lives of so many companies as we go through. Right. Um, it is um, uh, very much appreciated because we worry about the uh, uh, upstream oil and gas companies, but uh, actually the uh, uh, refined products, uh, those companies which are uh, making these refined products are also uh, facing actually upfront uh, from the challenge of a decreasing demand. And then that implicates other industries as uh, Dr. Van Velkel uh, pointed out. Uh, thank you uh, for the very good point, very important point. Um, the, uh, I thought uh, Mr. Kobayashi uh, may want to have the floor on this question because uh, you may need to uh, explain a little further why we um, in Japan thought about the uh, importance of uh, other two in the middle, uh, the uh, recycle and the reuse. Kobayashi-san. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just, I just unmuted. Uh, thank you for Yamashita, uh, for your um, pointing me, Yamashita san. Yes, um, in my opinion, generally speaking, um, reduce has to be the central piece of the climate action because it directly um, reduces the um, fossil fuel production, fossil fuel use to reduce the carbon. So uh, I do not argue against that uh, reduces the uh, most important segment in 4R in terms of climate action. But at the same time, as Yamashita mentioned that we have uh, spent a lot of efforts to um, enhance the energy efficiency and replace uh, carbon intensive energy with something else uh, in the past. So there aren't many uh, room left for further uh, uh, substitute to uh, such uh, fossil fuel production. And that's why um, we uh, have to work on the hydrogen to uh, further reduce or further substitute fossil fuel reuse in the energy mix. Uh, that's one of the major points in the presentation and in the CC scenario. And at the same time, um, yes, hydrogen is very important and, and we will definitely need to have a hydrogen in our uh, energy mix. But uh, um, um, according to our own analysis, um, green hydrogen is still prohibitive in terms of uh, cost. So that uh, for the moment, blue hydrogen will be a main supply source of the hydrogen. But uh, um, Japan does not have uh, um, uh, many suitable locations for CCS. So uh, we will um, use uh, more hydrogen in, in our energy mix in the future. But uh, we need to import hydrogen. So uh, my point is, um, um, because we do not have a uh, um, capacity to produce blue hydrogen, so we have to uh, work on something else. So that's why we, we will have to um, uh, work more intensively in the reuse and recycle segment, which regard carbon as a resource. Uh, to um, reduce the uh, entire amount of carbon in the air. So, um, um, so to your question, which uh, for a do you think more applicable in, in, in Japan case? Um, reduce is absolutely the most important, but at the same time, uh, because we do not have more rooms for uh, uh, reduce um, technology adoption, we have to work on reuse and recycling. So that's it thank, you very, thank you very much. Um, well, I suppose that the uh, hydrogen is being talked about uh, because it covers also the uh, uh, the combustion part. The uh, the industries uh, can look into this opportunity or this uh, uh, means of uh, uh, tackling the the decarbonization 
uh, once we start introducing this uh, carbon-free hydrogen, either green or blue. Um, let me move on to the second question, which uh, I have a, a few volunteers. The next question I uh, state was for companies in energy business, a rapid change towards decarbonization is a huge challenge. What do you think is most needed to meet this challenge? From your company's perspective, which of the four is most applicable? And um, um, I would like to invite to, uh, Mr. Leyburn first, uh, because he, you volunteer to answer this question, even though you may have mentioned already in your presentation. Please, floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, th I think I've cheated a bit by uh, linking to questions I've already answered. No, but um, it's a good good opportunity to summarise, and, and maybe I can start with linking to the last question, talking about uh, what do I think is the most important of the R's in the oil and gas industry, and um, backing up what the other speakers have already, panelists have already said. Um, clearly, reducing is the the ideal. It's the best. It's, it's the best way to. Uh, uh, reduce, re reduce the impact is, is reduce the pr production but uh, and, and there are still different speeds of you know uh, adaptation to this so there are still opportunities in the industry to reduce more and uh, I think this is being explored and this this is something that needs to continue urgently um, but I don't think it's uh, practical to expect that this to to happen overnight in all areas of this, uh, in all parts of the sector and that's why um, remove is is really important as part of the transition um, because you can use renew, remove to support existing industry existing infrastructure that's already been developed so it, it's really about being a transition rather than a revolution and about mm -hmm. using you know um, remove as part of that transition and that's why we i kept emphasizing the fact that blue hydrogen is probably going to be really key um, for the next 50 years or however long uh, but green hydrogen is the final destination because we eventually want to remove, you know, we want to solve this problem entirely, but we have to go through intermediate steps. And I, I think the same is true for chemical industry, for the, uh, the chemical sector, for the uh, uh, upstream oil and gas sector. Um, so touching upon what do I think is the mo is most needed? Um, firstly, willingness. Uh, companies need to really uh, want to do this. Uh, and we're seeing this happen. I mean, we're seeing uh, companies take this more and more seriously. They're being pressured by a lot of their stakeholders. Uh, shareholders now are becoming more and more active, uh, pushing um, for, for greater attention on this matter. Um, also their employees. And I, I've been really surprised the number of employees mm -hmm. I've seen in oil and gas companies who are really passionate about pushing this forward. I think that, that's fantastic. Um, secondly, we, we talked about technologies. I, I don't want to go into detail, but you know, having the right technologies, we, we've already got the technology, but we need to refine it and we need to improve it. So a lot of the, the pilot projects that are currently going on around the world, uh, lots of exciting pilots are happening, and they are essential really to, to refine the technology, demonstrate the safety, uh, and show that this can really work. And then finally, as, as I highlighted in my um, presentation, I, cost is is an issue and you know i think that without uh, it, it's uh, a lot of things will happen uh, on their own but in order to achieve the speed necessary to hit the paris climate targets we need perhaps a little more push to to speed up the transition to speed up the adoption and that really really needs government uh, government support um uh, really around making the um the cost of uh, the making these technologies uh, commercially viable, and then allowing them to move down that uh, scaling process to reduce the cost to uh, to, to, to um, self-supporting levels. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, I agree. Um, I I see that you are echoing uh, uh, Mr. Tui's uh, earlier presentation uh, that the government's uh, support in the early stage is required, and because uh, we need to make it commercialized. Um, I. I would like to uh, invite uh, Dr. Van Berkel to uh, talk a little bit about uh, this question because you were uh, giving advice to the companies on the uh, technical in, uh, innovation or technical investment. Dr. Yeah, and I think, yeah. So thanks. The, um, the debate here between blue and green hydrogen, I think, is a really important one and really interesting one. So it's if, if you're looking at remove, uh, remove is still quite expensive, right? Mm -hmm. Carbon capture is not 
hard to do. We, we have the technology, it's just very expensive to do, and it's not productive because what you it's not productive in the sense that you're not making uh, a consumer product eventually. You're, you're getting CO2, you're putting it um, on the ground, which in a sense is productive because you're taking carbon out of the system, which is something we need to be doing if, if we want to limit climate change, but it's very hard to have a business for that. And, and therefore, so James comments about government support, um, if there were a business which would reward the act of making sure that carbon leaves the system, uh, that would be great, but that's really hard to do because it's something that benefits all countries. So who's gonna pay for it? I don't see the UN levying taxes and, and trying to, to pay for that, right? So that's one remark, but back to blue and green hydrogen. What I see happening there is that I think green hydrogen may well overtake blue hydrogen, uh, which, which would make um, uh, DNP uh, reconsider, as, as you promised you would do, uh, James, with your, uh, with your outlooks. Um, with, with green hydrogen uh, at a electricity price of, a, of between one and two cents per kilowatt hour, um, green hydrogen already becomes competitive to blue hydrogen. And we are seeing those kind of prices already emerge, right? We, we're seeing um, solar, utility scale solar in the US at prices of around 1.6, 1.7 cents per kilowatt hour. We're seeing wind and solar in the Middle East at prices even below that, say 1.4 cents per kilowatt hour. So. Uh, rapidly, uh, the energy that would make green hydrogen competitive to blue hydrogen is becoming available. And it's more a matter of scaling now. Uh, but then for the remove part for the blue hydrogen, it's also a matter of scaling. So which technology are you actually going to scale? And I think um, it's, it's again, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm only bringing dilemmas to the table right now. But again, for the industry, this is a real dilemma because do you invest in blue hydrogen um, while you run the risk that green hydrogen may well overtake it? So you're scaling exact, the, basically the wrong solution. Or do you now invest in green hydrogen, which currently is more expensive, but if it does overtake uh, the blue hydrogen solution, say in the next six years, uh, you may not regret uh, doing just that. Um, currently, our thinking is, uh, and, and basically also encouraged by uh, what um, uh, Vipul has been telling us from India, um, I think green hydrogen currently is the safer bet. And that's also what we see in, in a lot of different uh, activities, like the steel industry is investing massively right now in electrolyzers. Um, and granted, they are still piloting projects, but they're big uh, and, and they're the Swedish steel is trying to make uh, steel out of iron ore using just hydrogen, no more coal involved, no more coax involved. Um, so uh, I think there's a, there's a lot of very rapid technology development there pointing in the direction of the newer technology becoming more relevant much sooner um, than, uh, than we would have anticipated even only a year ago. So it's really important to watch the, the rate of development now. Thank you, Ari. Um, I think it's a very important point that I would like to invite back uh, uh, Mr. Tully uh, because uh, and there was a great recommendation from uh, uh, Dr. Van Belkel about the green hydrogen is the solution for India. But uh, you may have uh, other views uh, related to the, the uh, business sector's uh, interest. In yeah. The, uh... no, just uh, thank you. I, I think on this issue of green hydrogen, I don't know uh, uh, honestly which will win or which won't. But certainly, as we look at it from the perspective of a renewables player, uh, it certainly seems like an interesting area to uh, to to uh, look at further. So, for instance, uh, uh, you know, when there's a massive build out of say solar capacity or wind capacity. There are large portions of, we are all familiar with the duck curve, which is the uh, daily variations of um, electricity demand, which causes a massive mismatch in supply. So to, 
And if at the same time you're trying to increase capacity very significantly and you're trying to uh, bring keep the costs down, then you have to minimize curtailment of, of uh, your, your renewables. And so that curtailment effectively drives the, um, uh, the opportunity cost of that electricity down fairly significantly, not to zero certainly, because otherwise it, it's uh, it, it, you miss the opportunity. But certainly, uh, it, it can drive it drive it low. And um, so, I do think uh, along. I mean, one one whole area of work that's going on is 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 storage in the form of batteries and to refeed that power into the grid later. But equally, um, I do believe there is a lot of potential in in looking very hard at uh, green hydrogen production from, from say remote, maybe skid mounted, maybe containerized um, uh, hydrogen production facilities where currently the costs are quite prohibitive, but again, we are really at the beginning of the, of the uh, technology development and, and optimization. You know, you, you, give, uh, you, you give that basic technology to a few hundred companies in, in, um, in developing countries in, in Asia and they can do sort of wonders with the costs in terms of innovations and and capital costs and so on so I, I feel there is there is certainly an opportunity there but maybe coming back to the other question uh, I think there's probably a fifth R and I would agree also with what James said about um, uh, you know companies sort of signing up to the transition and maybe there's a fifth R which is resolve I think it starts with resolve. Once the whether it's due to shareholder pressure, lender pressure, activist pressure, whatever it may be, or whether it's actually because you know companies look at it and say, "Hey, hang on, uh, you can we can see where the future is and let's try to make that work." So I do think it starts with resolve. Uh, I've I've mentioned quite uh, frequently in my remarks that as far as Semcorp is concerned, we are really working. Uh, in different countries at different opportunities on all four of the other R's. But I, I really want to say this fifth or first first R, zeroth R, which is the resolve, is really part of part of what we do, and that's that's moving forward. Um, I think the other way to look at it is I, I do think the 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 availability of uh, commercial solutions in terms of balancing risk and reward. Balancing risk and reward is really where I think there are still a fair bit of mismatches. So uh, some of those were, uh, were highlighted as in the case of blue hydrogen, but actually if you go through each of the opportunities, whether the ones I've highlighted or dozens more, uh, each of them, the moment the risk and reward matches, mm. there is enough capital in the world, it will flow very, very fast there are enough entrepreneurs looking for opportunities. We have to balance the risk and reward. We can't go in and say that, you know, the rewards are very, very low. You may make money, a small amount, a long time in the future, but you have to put all the capital now. Essentially, we are trying to solve a commercial problem. And uh, just as that can be applied to mature technologies, it does need to be applied to some of these uh, earlier technologies as well. Well, uh, it seems that currently we are asking uh, very difficult questions or challenge to the uh, companies. Okay, which option you take? Uh, it's a huge money to invest, and we don't know which will be the winner. Uh, but uh, yeah, yeah. But of course, no, uh, yeah. absolutely. Yes. Sorry. No, please, please. No, no. I was just going to. I, I was just going to say, you know, because if, if you look at this one particular R around. Um, uh, which, which deals with the efficiency. I'm not sure. I, I can't remember exactly which one that was, but I'm uh, certainly the uh, uh, you know if I look at the, uh, the reuse, so. both reuse mm -hmm. and the recycling, would both fundamentally depend on efficiency. Because today there are opportunities in technology that allow us to head towards or dream of the kinds of efficiency that just were not possible. Mm -hmm. so once you have the the risk rewards balanced and gets get companies started off on a path. The efficiency benefits after that, I'll give you an example from our own renewables portfolio. You know, when renewables were built uh, uh, in India, say 10 years ago or 15 years ago, people would put up the wind turbines, essentially use them as depreciation uh, tax shields, essentially. And they would, they would run, sometimes they'd run, they'd run on based on time-based availability. Sometimes they'd run 80% of the time. The really good ones would run 90% of the time. Mm -hmm. Today, you can't even imagine 
renewables running like that. Today, for instance, in India, we have close to a thousand turbines uh, around the country. Each and every one of them has real-time data that comes into our central servers that's monitored 24 by seven, not just by, by our analytics engines, but also by experts who are sitting there looking at every turbine 24 by seven alarms are managed. And so today, even one uh, iota of wind doesn't go wasted. One iota of sunshine doesn't go, go wasted because what ends up happening is today we are saying, okay, why is the energy-based availability 95, 96, 97%? Why can't it be 98? Why can't it be 99? So what that does directly in terms of costs and therefore that reuse is actually quite remarkable. Mm. And so I think uh, uh, we, as long as the initial risk rewards of these new opportunities are roughly in the ballpark, I think we have to trust industry that they have the resolve, they're pretty responsible, they'll get on with it and then things will improve from there. Thank you very much. I, I think it's uh, these four are all um, uh, the carbon uh, recycle, circular carbon economy concept is actually to put things into the perspective. Uh, we do have a, a lot of technologies already there, but uh, well, we try to uh, redefine these technologies into this concept and then, then we, can, we may be able to come up with the new business ideas also. Uh, thank you very much, Andy. I would like to move on to the uh, actually the uh, third question for which uh, Mr. Labour and Grant here to answer. Large scale decarbonization requires huge potential in CCS. What are the pros and cons of such expectations towards CCS? Although we have briefly already discussed the CCS, and then the already uh, Dr. Belkel mentioned that the well, uh, it is very good, but it's very difficult to make it into business. Uh, how would you say? What do you say about that? Thank you. Thank you. That, that's uh, yeah. That's a good question. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks for the other opinions shared by uh, Dr. Berkel and uh, Mr. Pippel. I, I think they've been really interesting topics. So first of all, I, I would really like to respond to uh, Dr. Van Berkel's comment about um, carbon capture and and storage could be considered wasteful of carbon. But I think we should probably split this into carbon capture and storage. In certain circumstances, it makes sense. Uh, in certain countries. In other places, storage is not feasible. It's not, not a good use, but carbon capture and utilization, the, the recycling of that carbon is, is, is very viable. And I think the Netherlands is a great example of a country which is developing a lot of um, opportunities on using that carbon in smart ways, for example, supporting the agricultural industry. So, um, so splitting CCU and CCS may, may work. And I think this is one of the, the challenges with, uh, with carbon capture is that it's, it, it needs to suit the, the, the country specific requirements and, and what the geography and things allow. But uh, yeah, um, the other major con of CCUS at the moment is, is, is really around cost, um, as, as we've discussed, and this, this risk reward benefit of uh, you know, uh, how do you make it um, worth the, uh, the time for, for, for vendors to develop it. Um, the pros um, is that it's it's an existing technology, uh, as you mentioned, uh, Dr. Van Berkel, and that it can be applied to a whole range of existing infrastructure um, quite straightforwardly. And I think this is where I wanted to come back to the, the blue versus green hydrogen discussion point. Um, I think actually you and I are in, in agreement. Uh, we Everybody wants to see green hydrogen take off, but it really is a matter of scaling and, and how quickly you can develop sufficient size and capacity to make that globally viable. And what we're looking at now for the sort of hydrogen industry is developing all the infrastructure around hydrogen. So, you know, uh, uh, Kobayashi-san was mentioning the, the fact that Japan might need to import hydrogen. So where does that hydrogen come from? So the sort of hydrogen shipping infrastructure, um, all this sort of surrounding, uh, whether you use pipelines, how do you utilize hydrogen pipelines, all these infrastructure questions need to be answered. And a lot of that will come from um, taking step changes from existing infrastructure and existing companies, you know, looking at how they can transition their existing infrastructure uh, in Europe, looking at reusing existing pipeline networks, um, using the knowledge from the LNG industry to transition to hydrogen shipping potentially or, or ammonia or whatever. Um, so I, I think that, that it's not, a, it's very difficult to justify creating a whole hydrogen industry just straight from developing green, in, green hydrogen today and scaling it very, very quickly. 
Whereas if you look at blue hydrogen as a sort of starting point, you can use the existing, uh, uh, the exist look at the existing gas and coal industries in Australia, for example, they can use CCS very quickly to develop quite large scale hydrogen um, using existing infrastructure. And then gradually the green hydrogen in Australia will, could overtake that as the, as the primary source. So really um, coming back to yeah, the, the question that was asked, uh, Cons of uh, CCS, uh, CCUS cost, and the fact that you need to make it um, suitable for the local geography, and, and particularly with storage, there are associated risks of that. Um, and then the pros are that the technology exists and it's very adaptable, so we can use it in different ways, and it can be very quickly applied to existing infrastructure, existing industries, and uh, to reduce the carbon footprint of those industries quickly. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, the, I, I, the idea is that if the business, uh, already existing business with existing technologies uh, get involved, uh, they can actually visualize uh, what would be the supply chain, what is not yet there and what are required. Uh, therefore, uh, in parallel to uh, investing or conducting research on the blue or green hydrogen, how to produce that uh, in a large scale uh, to reduce the cost. Uh, we also have to develop the demand side, uh, the large market, uh, so that the, all these industries in between uh, will, be get, will be involved uh, to develop these uh, uh, the value chain available uh, in the future. So the green or blue hydrogen will be delivered to the consumers, uh, probably. Uh, okay, I had about this kind of discussion uh, in Japan, uh, the people are concerned even if the, uh, uh, the production of the hydrogen is successful, whether to put that uh, near the CCS site or near the port makes the cost very different. So we have to think about it. And then also it involves the national circumstances, nationally, uh, uh, you know, domestically available resources and uh, means of uh, uh, transport. So uh, there are so many details we have to think about it uh, if that will be commercialized. Ah, uh, we are actually, we had a plenty of time when we started, but we're reaching actually to the end of the Q&A session. So I actually would like to uh, skip a question four because Ms., uh, Mr. Tuli has uh, made a very good presentation on that uh, related to the question. And then the next one is relevant to the question four. So I would like to invite Kobayashi-san who volunteered. Uh, he is the only one who volunteered to answer this. He thinks that this is very important. Is the carbon circular economy a concept which is suitable for growing Asia? Yes. Um, okay. Uh, thank you, Yamashita san, uh, pointing me. Uh, before answering the question number five, I'd like to make some um, comments on the blue and green hydrogen issues. Uh, this is a very long discussion, so I wouldn't go into detail here. But uh, I'd like to point out uh, some reasons why we assume that 90% of hydrogen will be blue. Um, we have a um, power opt optimization model in each country, and we just run under the assumption of large, uh, large um, installation of renewable energies. And we found that, um, and we calculated the redundant supply of power generation generated from those power units. And we assume that the, this redundant power generation will be utilized for hydrogen uh, production, green hydrogen production. And we found that the, the amount of the redundant, um, blue uh, redundant power generation from those power units are very limited to, uh, in terms of the entire hydrogen demand. And uh, uh, so um, we, we, we have just our uh, own calculation and uh, have found that the, the, the amount of uh, green hydrogen in our estimates. So um, in my opinion, um, renewable energy should be utilized as electricity instead of hydrogen if they are uh, generated. So once they um, convert that electricity into hydrogen, it will another, increase another uh, cost and is not really efficient uh, in terms of energy. So um, we believe, still believe that uh, blue hydrogen has a large potential in a future energy mix. And you, you are correct that the CCS does not generate uh, value in itself, but uh, if they combine with the other utilization purpose like reuse and recycle, it still can create value. 
that's um, my uh, very brief observation in your comments. And uh, in terms of question number five, yes, um, CC is a very relevant concept to uh, growing Asia um, because um, before the pandemic, I, um, I have regularly uh, contacted with uh, government officials, the industry people in, within this Asian region. And uh, they still, they have a very acute dilemma whether to which to pro prioritize economic growth or uh, um, reduce inequalities or uh, climate actions. Um, and uh, so uh, in, in addressing such dilemma, uh, in my opinion, uh, circular carbon economy is a very, uh, brings a very important implications uh, because they, um, that the concept is very neutral to emission reduction technologies. So um, they treat all the technology in, in the uh, same, uh, same level, equal foot level. So um, um, uh, because um, in Asia has a lot of issues to uh, uh, address. So they need to uh, deploy all available technologies if it contributes to address the uh, problem. So um, the concept of circular carbon economy has a pro, uh, bring some, uh, uh, provide a holistic approach to, uh, to uh, address various issues, uh, uh, climate actions and uh, economic growth and uh, affordable en uh, energy supply at affordable cost. So um, I think the circular concept of circular carbon economy is very relevant in the Asian context. Okay. Well, thank you very, very much. Um, well, uh, by now, uh, we have so many questions from the floor. Um, I'd like to pick the, the most popular one, uh, which, say, which is asking actually a very uh, profound question. And then this is um, for any volunteer to answer. I, let me read it clearly. Is circular carbon economy really viable in the long run? Will the pros and cons outweigh the fossil fuels? So the, is it viable in the long run? Uh, somebody did mention that the, okay, so the business uh, decision is rather difficult, which way to invest uh, the blue or green. It's uh, similar to this probably. Uh, is that, yeah. Does anybody have answer to that? Yeah, can I answer? Oh yes, please, yeah, thank yeah, you. Yes, yes. Um, in my opinion, circular carbon economy is viable. Um, we shouldn't misinterpret that the uh, circular carbon economy uh, reject renewable energy. It includes renewable energy as a reduced segment. I, I'm saying that the uh, 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 the circular carbon economy includes uh, all available technology, including renewable. So if um, uh, in one day, uh, renewable energy uh, or re nuclear or energy conservation technology will be uh, very, com very much cost competitive. Then we just take that reduced segment options and just uh, stop the using the remove or reuse recycling. So um, circular carbon economy is a comprehensive and holistic approach. It does not reject renewable energy. So um, by definition, circular carbon economy is viable at any time. In my, that's my opinion. Any other uh, Maybe I'd like to add a perspective to that, which is, uh, I, I think the circular economy is made up of so many different things that we have to look at them uh, in different uh, categories. So certainly there are some parts of it that are not only viable, but highly viable today. So for instance, if you look at it in the context of the resource crunch that we are facing, if you go to many cities in the world that are facing uh, uh, massive water shortages, uh, recycle, but at the same time, there is massive industrial water usage and there's massive agricultural water usage. Uh, while cities are pumping out huge amounts of, of, of sewage, uh, taking that sewage, recycling that sewage, using it for industrial uses is certainly viable. It's certainly cheaper than say desalination or uh, uh, you know, depleting very, very scarce groundwater. 
there are other so so some things are viable we can go on and on with examples there are others where i think viability is being established and they are in the process of scale growing and so on and i think renewables falls into that category but if you look at where renewables have come from certainly in my country renewables have gone from i think uh, 5 6 rupees per unit of electricity which is sort of close to i would say 8 9 cents that it used to be down to uh, today close to around i would say around 3 cents um uh, 3 to 4 cents today uh, and so that's a massive drop they they still rely on some subsidies like grid support and so on but i think the path is very clear and and uh, commercial solutions are being found to make them viable and uh, um, they will be viable but, but i think more than any of this we have to look at it in terms of what's happening to the planet yeah uh, if you believe the science and i have no reason not to uh, if you look at the two degree scenarios if you look at where we are or or even if you leave uh, the the temperature side of it aside you simply look at what's going on on emissions and so on i think we have to look at the viability in in a broader social sense as well I'll leave it at that um well uh, the i agree um the we i co we i set the question as a carbon circular economy but actually it's a circular economy uh which is the concept uh which has been existing and and that is actually the uh, three r before uh without the uh, i don't know which one was not there remove uh so and then we added one uh to make it happen uh for the decarbonization concept um and and this is the main uh g20 uh discussion item uh one of the items and and the uh it it actually covers uh oh, my hand is disappearing uh the covers uh this uh, three r concept of the other recycling or reuse or uh the circular economy concept so and and it is very important uh, for the sustainable development uh it's not only energy but also food or water or air um therefore it it should cover all of them um i have um, one question um this may actually uh be pointed at uh, kobayashi san the circular carbon economy was recently endorsed by the g20 energy ministers can you explain the significance of this is this a push factor way a push factor way uh, from fossil fuels um kobayashi san you have been a member of the working group of for g20 <laughs> movement uh thank you for the question um i i i'm not really sure we, whether it is a push factor for fossil fuel um under this circumstances is there any such move uh, at all in uh, to push for fossil fuel i just mentioned i'd like to note that uh, um in my presentation um circular carbon economy is a way to manage carbon is a way to reduce the carbon in the air so um it does not uh, um uh it is not against the move towards the climate action that that's a very important point and uh, what is significant in the concept of circular carbon economy is that it uh, is a very holistic approach so if they cannot cannot reduce the carbon with the existing mainstream technologies like renewables or energy conservation or nuclear then we have we will, we can utilize this uh, uh carbon which could not be reduced with the existing technology for other purposes that we use in recycling and then we may have still uh, some uh carbon left after we reduce we use recycling then we have to think about how to remove it as a ccs so um i don't really think that the uh, circular carbon the concept of circular carbon economy is a kind of following wind for fossil fuel it rather provides a more comprehensive holistic approach to reduce carbon in the air i understand that this um, uh, demonstration uh, for the g20 is actually importing ammonium uh, carbon free ammonium did the ccs uh, in saudi arabia and bring it as a form of ammonium as a carrier Uh, for hydrogen and then it will be added to the uh, uh, coal fired power plants 
uh, although it is a state of the art, uh, that will actually open up the opportunity uh, for the uh, existing uh, coal-fired power plants uh, to become more sustainable if they can utilize the uh, carbon-free hydrogen in the form of ammonium to burn and then, then uh, keep using. Because uh, I understand that in India or ASEAN countries, the, all these coal-fired power plants are still young in age. Uh, it is very difficult to ask them to demolish all, all these and then they switch to the uh, gas and then make it cleaner or uh, put the hydrogen, uh, put up the hydrogen fire uh, station. Uh, so um, uh, it may open up the opportunity, but it is a very strong way to come. And then also CCS is uh, uh, not uh, uh, available, readily available everywhere at the cost effective uh, way. So uh, this is the demonstration to, to open the gate for us to uh, start thinking about it. Um, and then also this will uh, give us, give the uh, supply chain uh, in, uh, the uh, involvement uh, for the uh, private companies to, uh, to make their strategy on how to get involved in hydrogen. Okay, so I am running out of time. Um, so I would like to thank all the panelists uh, for the great contribution on this topic. Especially my special thank you goes to Dr. Belkel because he is participating in this discussion from Europe. It is like a three to four o'clock in the morning. But he said, yes, by all means, I'll be there. So I really thank, I am really thankful to him. Uh, we are all sitting in Asia, so uh, it's okay for us, but uh, thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Van Belkel for being there. Uh, I am so excited that we had a very good discussion. Uh, this concept uh, will be uh, more publicized um, in the G20, which is upcoming, uh, but uh, we each may have some different ideas about it. I hope that the definition will be, will be cleared up and then that we will start uh, working on commercialization of this tool. And then the hopefully we will get closer to the Paris Agreement target. Thank you very much all for participating. Thank you very much for the great questions for the, from the floor. So bye-bye for now and see you again very soon. Thank you.